From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 17, recorded on September 19, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, I'd like to discuss Paul's recent column, Does Everyone Need a Yearly COVID Booster? Now, Paul, the CDC is recommending a booster dose of COVID vaccine for everyone over six months of age. So first, start by telling us what is this booster that they want us to have? Okay, so so this year's vaccine, and they often don't refer to it as a booster. That's They'll right. call it right. 2023, 2024 vaccine for this, this year's campaign. They'll use the term campaign occasionally. Um, it is it is a monovalent vaccine, meaning it has one strain, and it's the XBB 1.5 strain, which is similar to a number of strains that are currently circulating. So that's what it is. And and on September the 12th, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practice sat down to make a decision about what they wanted to do with this vaccine. Now, at the time, there were a number of countries, the United Kingdom, Germany, the three of the Scandinavian countries, Australia and, and the World Health Organization, that basically offered or argued for a targeted recommendation. Because the thinking by these countries was, we need to prevent severe disease. Severe disease defined as having to go to the hospital or intensive care unit. So let's target those groups who are most likely to suffer severe disease. And so those groups are, are typically those who are elderly, which has been variously defined, those who have multiple health problems like obesity, diabetes, chronic lung, heart, kidney disease, people who are immune compromised typically because they're uh, receiving medicines that suppress the immune system, and people who are pregnant. That's the decision all those countries made. Now, when the ACIP, or Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, sat down on September 12th for a six-hour meeting from 10 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon, they never considered that. That was not an option. It wasn't presented. It wasn't discussed. The only option was to vaccinate everybody over six months of age, um, period. Now, they offered several reasons for that. Um, three, basically. One was um, prevention of long COVID. That the thinking was is that by having additional booster doses that you could lessen the risk of long COVID, for which there's not a lot of evidence. Now, long COVID is variously described and defined. Um, and it's hard to do the kinds of studies now that we had a lot of natural infection out there to kind of answer this question. But there was one study that did look at that. It was published uh, uh, in, in JAMA. I think it was, it was uh, done in Italy in 2022. And what they did was they look at looked at people who hadn't gotten any, any doses of vaccine and then got COVID and found the instance of long COVID, at least by their definition, was 42% of people got long COVID. Not vaccinated, got COVID, 42% covered long COVID. Then they looked at people who got one dose of vaccine who then got COVID. The incidence dropped from 42% to 30%. Then looked at people who got two doses of vaccine and then got COVID, went from, from 30% to 17%. Then looked at people who got three doses of vaccine and then suffered COVID, and it went from 17% to 16%. So there was no advantage to that additional booster dose. The second argument that was made was obesity. Obesity is definitely a risk factor for this, this uh, disease. You're much more likely to suffer severe disease if you're obese. And the number that they offered for the percentage of people in the U.S. that are obese was 70%, which isn't exactly right. It's it's 70% of people in this country are overweight. A much smaller percentage of that 70% are obese. And being overweight is not per se a risk factor. But the thinking was, well, if 70% of people are obese, then let's just vaccinate everybody. But even that doesn't make sense because why then vaccinate the 30% who aren't obese, although that number was really high. It's really overweight. The third reason um, that was offered was the, uh, I thought the most disingenuous, which was if you look at the group that's most likely to be hospitalized, it's people, not surprisingly, it's people over 75. The second most common group likely to be hospitalized are children between six months and four years of age. It's true. Now, children generally are the least vaccinated group and children less than four are the least of the least vaccinated group. So they have uh, roughly a 10 percent vaccination rate in children less than four. So the reason they're getting hospitalized is not because they haven't been boosted. The reason they're getting hospitalized is they haven't been vaccinated. So I'm all for vaccinating uh, children who are um, who are less than four years of age who haven't been vaccinated. 
And so that's where they came to that recommendation. Um, and so now we are living with that. And I think we'll see how this plays out. But, but what, what worries me is I think it's a lost opportunity to really educate the public about who really is at greatest risk. By saying everybody's at risk, you're implying that everybody's at equal risk. And I just think that uh, does a disservice in terms of trying to communicate who's most likely to benefit. So some people have said that it's better to have a unified message rather than fragmented messages. What do you think about that? Right. So, so there are people who've been communicating who said that to, to have a nuanced message is to have a garbled message. But I, I don't think, I think it's a little paternalistic. I think you can, you can explain to the American public why you're doing things in a certain way. We certainly do that for other vaccines. I mean, when the monoclonal antibody directed against respiratory syncytia virus came out, for, for children, and certainly uh, young children can suffer respiratory syncytial virus. It's the most common reason to be admitted to the hospital for a young child is respiratory syncytial virus. Um, the recommendation was for everybody uh, up to eight months of age to get a single dose of this particular monoclonal antibody called Nersevimab for, the, for essentially the first season. Well, for the second season, it's really, if you're going to be admitted when you're between eight and 19 months of age, um, it's because you have a high risk. That's why you're admitted. And so we have four high risk groups for that second season. That's a nuanced recommendation, but it's the appropriate recommendation. I just think you have to be able to explain things. There are a number of vaccines for which you have groups that are targeted because they're at highest risk. And I think that's true here, too. So I don't think that's the reason. I think there's another reason for this, and it may be that it's just a we have a at some level dysfunctional healthcare system, and that the thinking was that by recommending it for everybody, therefore everybody will be covered by private insurers, except for those obviously who are uninsured or underinsured for which you have this bridging access program. Because certainly there are other people who reasonably and should get this vaccine. So, for example, people who work in nursing homes, people who are, are living in a home with someone who's immune compromised can all reasonably choose and importantly choose to get this vaccine. And maybe that's what they were scared of. But explain that. If that's the reason, explain that. Because otherwise, I think you you don't have trust in the American public. And I think you can trust them to understand what's going on. Well, I, I think what's telling is that, as you mentioned earlier, other countries are not doing this. They're having targeted vaccination. And I don't see that we know anything different here in the U.S. than they do. Right. And so one one group has postulated, well, maybe the reason for that is that those are those have uh, national health systems. And mm -hmm. so it's it, uh, they have a better health. But, you know, Canada recently also made a recommendation similar to that. So it's not just that. I, I don't get it. I really don't. I'm I'm a little disappointed in that. I think, you know, certainly privately people have told me, no, I think I think it's true. We probably should just really tar target high risk groups. But nonetheless, um, sometimes when they publicly speak, they, mm -hmm. they they follow what the CDC is saying. And I get that. I mean, you don't want to appear to be divided. But my feeling on this is just say what you think is true. I, I we're, it'll be we'll see what happens this year. Let's see what happens. Last year, we made the same recommendation. Everybody over six months of age get a vaccine. And one of five Americans who were recommended to get it, meaning everybody over six months of age, got it. Um, let's see what happens this year. Do, do, do more people get it or less? I'm sure it's going to be less just because of the way that the um, the, the paying is working. The government's not paying this year. The, the other thing that, that really bothers me in this, and, and, and I hope I'm wrong about this, is that they, they, when we met, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee met in June to discuss this, what we were going, what were we going to use for the monovalent vaccine this year, and, and set our own XBB15. The term that was used was campaign for this year's campaign. Well, that implies something similar to flu vaccine. And this is not flu. Uh, flu is strain specific. Um, every year we, we sit down and we pick flu strains, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. And if we're wrong, and we've been wrong three times in the last 20 years, all with H3N2, the H3N2 strain of influenza that came in the country was not the strain that was in the vaccine. And for groups, including high risk groups, some of the protection was well less than 20 percent. That's not true with this virus. And I think the reason it's not true is that in terms of protecting against severe disease, T cells are important. And those T cell recognition sites are generally conserved and have been. And I think that's why we continue to be pretty well protected against severe disease. If you've had, say, three doses of the vaccine or two doses plus a natural infection, I think this is a three-dose vaccine. But I do think that if, you, if you've if you had that, and 
the vast majority of this country at this point has hybrid immunity, meaning vaccinated plus naturally infected in whatever order. And so that's why with such a high level of population, immunity, that's why you're seeing a decline. If, the, if, this was, if, that, if this virus was flu and it changed so much from one year to the next that you weren't protected the following year, then I think you'd see what you see every year with flu, which is the same thing. You'd see, you know, a, a couple hundred thousand hospitalizations. You'd see 40 to 60,000 deaths as we do pretty much every year. But that doesn't seem to be true for this virus. We'll see how it plays out. But I, I just worry when we liken this to flu. So you say we'll see what happens. So are there, do you think there will be studies where they compare incidence and severity of disease in people who have this new uh, vaccine versus the ancestral course? Is that going to be something that's done? I hope so. I, I mean, I think what, what, what the CDC needs to do is they need to tell us who is getting hospitalized this year at specific, and who's dying. What are their ages? Um, what exactly are their comorbidities? Did they get a vaccine? If so, when was their last dose? Most importantly, did they take an antiviral, which I think uh, Dr. Griffin on uh, his clinical updates consistently makes that point about how we tend to overlook that. And, um, and who are they? And, and then in, in concert with academic immunologists, I would like to see a, sort of a more longitudinal look at how frequencies of T cells, especially cytotoxic T cells, are holding up over time. I mean, I'll take myself as an example. I've had three doses of the Wuhan 1 strain. My last dose was in November of 2021. I had a, a mild two-day infection in, in uh, May of 2022 with what was probably a BA2 strain because that was prominent at the time. I think I'm protected. I didn't get last year's bivalent vaccine. I'm not getting this year's vaccine because I think I have high frequencies of T cells. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, will I would like the academic immunologists in concert with CDC epidemiologists to answer those questions. So the manufacturers have put, released data showing that the, this vaccine uh, induces neutralizing antibodies against itself and uh, other circulating Omicron sublineages. Is that enough to know that it will have an effect? Do we know what titers will give you an effect? <laughs> I, I think it's reassuring. I think what that says okay. is that if you if you choose to get a vaccine, I think if I got the vaccine this year, I think what that would do is that would offer me several months of protection against mild illness. And then it wouldn't after three to six months, which is what happened to me with the Wuhan one strain. Six months after my last dose, I had a two-day mild illness, mm -hmm. as no doubt my neutralizing antibodies faded. I think that also would be true here, too. Um and, and also, the, in terms of um, what we need to know, to what extent are those T cells boostable? I mean, you on TWIV have had people like Daniela Weisskopf and Alexandra Setti and, and Shane Crotty and uh, people like Scott Hensley and, and, and uh, John Weary at Penn. Th those are T cell immunologists. And, mm -hmm. and every time we meet at the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, and I think this is true of the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practice, too, we never talk about T cells, even though, as Dan Baruch, who's a Harvard immunologist, had said, T cells are the unsung hero of this pandemic. And I think that's right. Many people have asked me if it would be worthwhile measuring antibody titers to see who should be vaccinated. Is that something that's useful? Um, I think we, we, in terms of just fo focusing on antibodies, we focus on antibodies. I'm not sure. How, how do you mean that? Vincent? Well, I mean that, uh, let's say you, a person wants to know if they should get a booster. What if they have high antibody titers already? Could you get a, a level of that measured in them? No, I've been asked that question when I've spoken to groups, especially seniors groups. Mm -hmm. They want to know whether they should get a booster. Wouldn't it make more sense instead of my getting a booster and exposing myself to the rare but real risks of, of any sort of serious adverse outcome? Wouldn't it make more sense for me to just measure my titers? Right. Yeah, you, you can do that. I, I don't, um, I think that probably if you have high levels of virus neutralizing antibodies, I think you're, you're probably well protected against mild disease for a while. But, you know, antibodies as a general rule are not long lived in the circulation. They do come down over about six months. And also many people say, all right, I understand your arguments, but what's the downside for getting a different COVID booster every year? Is, the, is there any? Right. And actually, that's that's one thing that kind of bothers me a lot is that <laughs> when people say, well, there's no downside. First of all, any any time you take any medicine or any biological, there's a downside. If it has an upside, it'll have a downside. The downside may be rare. It may be um, 
Um, very rare, but nonetheless, there's always a downside. And we're going to find out about this, this vaccine over time. It is a novel strategy. We certainly were surprised by myocarditis and pericarditis. And we'll see whether or not over time, you know, when we're five years into this, 10 years into this, 15 years into this, whether there's, there's any evidence of residual myocardial disease. Because the reason you have myocarditis is you're making immune response to your own heart muscle. I, I mean, it appears to be generally transient and short-lived, but there's invariably a spectrum of, of disease. And, and we'll find out about that over time. Time. And, and I think it's perfectly willing, to, reasonable to take those risks if the benefits are clear. But the, when the benefits aren't clear, then it's not so reasonable to take risk, even a rare risk. Right. You've said that multiple times on this program. If the benefits are not clear, if you don't have evidence that there will be a benefit, it, it's maybe not worth doing something, right? Right. Well, I think we're going to learn a lot this winter. I'm really curious because this is the highest level of population immunity we have ever had going into any winter. And we're assuming this is a winter respiratory virus, yeah. although the seasonality is not quite clear I, yet. I think we'll, it, it, the assumption is it will settle into being another winter respiratory virus, much as like the other four strains of human coronavirus are or flu, or paraflu, or human metanumavirus, we'll see. But we have a high level of population. I mean, I really think the CDC can help us out this year in showing us exactly who is getting hospitalized and, and why, and who is dying and why. And, um, and, and to answer the question, um, you know, who do we most need to focus on? I think one of the points that was made at the ACIP meeting, it's true, is no one's risk-free. I mean, if you're a healthy young mm -hmm. person, you still have some risk of being hospitalized or even dying. Sure, sure. I mean, that that's true. So the question is, does it make sense to focus on the high-risk groups? I, I think it does because it, I think, according to the CDC data up to this point, the vast majority of those who are hospitalized or die are in those high-risk groups. And I think the messaging should be to those groups because um, I think that will, would have the best impact. But we'll see. So these are, of course, recommendations by the CDC. They are not mandates. So people can do as they choose, correct? That's right. The, the federal government doesn't mandate vaccines. That occurs at the state or local level. It'll be interesting to see what hospitals do. Um, mm -hmm. Our hospital is offering the vaccine, but is certainly not mandating it. Um, right. they're, just, they're offering it because they assume most of the people who are in the hospital setting have probably hybrid immunity at this point. We've all been vaccinated, and many of us naturally infected. I think a lot of people will decide on their own. And so you are you disagree with the CDC broad recommendation. So do, do you have your own that you would say, th these are the people who should get this vaccine? I know, you, I know you said it at the top, but let's close by repeating. Sure. So, so what I would say is that I think anybody over 75 – any and anybody has comorbidities, especially diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, obesity. Um, I think anyone who is taking medicines that that suppress their immune system, and I think pregnant people. I, I also think really encourage Paxlovid for all those groups. So anybody in that group who has respiratory symptoms should test themselves and treat early. But also people who live in, in or work in nursing homes, people who are in the home of someone who's immune compromised, and frankly anybody who who just feels more comfortable getting this certainly should get it. I'm not saying that that that. You should discourage people from getting it if they really want to get it. I just think people need to understand who is at greatest risk. I think that's us doing our best educating to say, here who is, are those who, who are really at risk. And I think when we said, for example, as was said at that ACI, meeting, Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices meeting, that that six-month-old to four-year-old was getting hospitalized and most of those children are didn't have risk conditions. That's because they were unvaccinated. I certainly think people who are, haven't been vaccinated should be vaccinated. That also should be encouraged. No matter what age. No matter what age, because this virus is going to be with us for decades, probably. And if you're not, if you're at risk, if you were, if you never been naturally infected or vaccinated, you're at risk. I mean, uh, my wife and I are now proud grandparents of what is now a seven month old. We're certainly encouraging our son and daughter in law to get that little baby vaccinated because she has never been exposed to this virus. And if she's going to be exposed, I'd rather that she had um, adaptive immunity induced by a vaccine before that exposure. We'll put a link to Paul's original column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.